Man, I remember my first Easter in, in Loveland about 11, 12 years ago. And I was walking through the hallways, and one of the men in the church came up to me and said, Hey, have you heard? And I was like, What? And he's like, He's risen. And I was like, Oh, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. And uh, he did that for 12 years. Every year, he came up to me and said, Hey, man, have you heard? And I loved his enthusiasm. I loved his joy. I caught on after the first year. And so the second year, I was like, yeah, I've heard the tomb is empty and and Jesus is alive. I just want you to know that this morning that he is risen from the dead. Yes, he was crucified. He hung on the tree and he was buried and he was dead. But he didn't stay dead. On the third day, on Sunday morning, he was raised from the dead. The tomb is empty. And that changes everything. I mean, that is a game changer. That's a difference maker. Now, that's the end of the story, okay? So we're going to come back to that. I, I don't know how good it is to, to share the end of the story first, but I did. Uh, the, the, the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive, but I want to rewind a little bit. I want to rewind uh, to Friday evening. Okay, so Friday, they nailed him to the tree, and he was hanging on the cross, and he, he, he was dying, and he died. And they took his body down, and they buried him before sunset. That was Friday. And I want to, I want to look at, I want to, I want to linger for a while between the time he was buried Friday night and Sunday morning time he was raised from the dead. Because those are the hours that not are forgotten a lot, but those are the hours that perhaps are, are places we can relate to. I mean, put yourself in the sandals of the apostles. I mean, their leader had just died. They had put their hopes in this man. They, they had given, uh, given up occupations. That They had left families for this man named Jesus, and they followed after him. They put their, their faith in him. He was the Messiah, they believed. They followed him, and now he's dead. Now he's gone. Imagine, imagine the despair that just set in on them. And maybe questions. I don't know about you, but I think I would have some questions if I was in their camp. Why? What's going on? We thought you were the Messiah. We thought you were the one to come to redeem Israel. What's questions? Doubts would arise. Maybe a little bit of fear. I mean, if they killed Jesus and he was your leader, are they going to come after you next? So maybe there was some fear in, in their thinking as well. Maybe anger. I don't know. Maybe they were just a little bit angry at the whole situation and maybe angry at, angry at themselves, maybe for believing in this guy and leaving their occupations and leaving their families. Maybe a little bit angry in Jesus. This wasn't supposed to happen. Maybe angry at God. That's where they were. That's where they lived life on Friday evening and Saturday. And maybe you can relate. Maybe you can connect with that. Because you know what? I think you and I, we've had a few Saturdays ourselves. That life hits us. And we think to ourselves, lots of questions, but but not a whole lot of answers come. And and we have times where we enter into seasons of life where hope is just gone. Hope, where are you? And just despair sets in. Maybe some fear of today and maybe some fear of tomorrow is is leading and you're you're thinking and and seeped into your thoughts. Maybe a little bit of anger. God, I didn't expect this. God, I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. This wasn't part of the plan. Hope gone. Despair there, discouragement, fear, questions, anger. See, I think you and I, we can relate to the Saturday because I think we've been there. It's Easter 2017, and I was preaching at First Baptist in Loveland. I guess the service went well. I don't remember anything about the service except that my mom and dad weren't there. And if you know my mom and dad, they were in church. They were in church every Sunday. I mean, I, I tell people that I, I went to church nine months before I was born. I mean, they were just in church all the time, but they weren't that Sunday. And if, if you're going to miss a Sunday, you're not going to miss Easter, are you? I, I just don't. So I was like, where are they? And so I, so the service was over. I was going back home. I called my mom. I said, Mom, what's going on? And Mom said, well, your dad has another nosebleed. He'd been having some nosebleeds leading up to this time, and, 
And, but this one was uh, one they couldn't stop and, and to the point that they had to go to the ER and, and the ER doctor that had shoved something up his nose, my dad said it hurt really bad, and left it up there, nosebleed stopped. But then they said, you're going to have to go to the doctor, the ENT, the ear, nose, and throat doctor needs to see you. So they made an appointment Wednesday, I think, the fall after Easter. And so we went, I drove my parents to the doctor's appointment. The doctor took whatever they shoved up his nose out and looked up into his nose and his nasal cavity. And he said, I see, I think cancer. I think it's melanoma. And as far as I know, you can't do surgery on this. I give you about six months to live. I'm telling you what, sucker punched. I remember the drive back home that day, just 30 minutes, just 30 miles, but it was the longest 30 miles that I had driven in a while. Lots of questions had entered my mind, lots of thoughts. God, what's going on? Why is this happening? This wasn't part of the plan. Maybe a little bit of anger, anger at at God. God, this isn't right. Saturday. I I, I want us to look at a story we found in the Gospel of Luke. And so if you have your Bibles, you want to turn with me to the 24th chapter of Luke. We're going to look at a story of two disciples of Jesus. Not, not part of the 12, not, not of the apostolic team, but they still were disciples in the sense that they'd, they had made the decision to follow after this Jesus. And they were in Jerusalem for the week of Passover, the week of uh, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. But on, on this day, they were making their way back home. And their home was in Emmaus. It's about a seven-mile journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. I want to pick up the story in verse 13 of the 24th chapter in the Gospel of Luke. Now, here's what Luke tells us. That same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. What I want us to look at is this phrase, the same day. What day? If you read a little bit earlier in that chapter, what you find out is Luke's already been talking about the resurrection day. And Luke's already been talking about, hey, some women went to the tomb and found the tomb empty. And, and some angels came and, and said, why are you looking for living among the dead? And they, they came and talked to the apostles and said, hey, let me tell you what we found that day. And so what we know is that this is a Sunday which the disciples have left Jerusalem and are heading back to Emmaus. Now, here's what that tells me. It tells me that they didn't buy the story of the women. I mean, if if they bought the story of the women, that if they heard that Jesus was alive, would you not stay in Jerusalem to see if you could see this Jesus? Would you just bolt from Jerusalem? You've been there all week. You're thinking, let's just stay a few more hours. Maybe we can confirm that this story the women are telling us is true. But no, 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 they made the decision, it's time to go home. It's time to leave. See, I think these two disciples, they didn't buy the story of the women, and they thought, it's time for us to get on with our lives. We've spent too many days following this Jesus, and we've been disappointed. Our our, our world has come crashing down, and we're just trying to find a little bit of hope, maybe, to keep going on. And I'm not going to chase this fantasy any longer. I'm not going to chase this idea of Jesus being the Messiah. It's time to go home. That same day, the day that they heard Jesus had been raised from the dead, they didn't buy it, I believe. They made their way back home. And verse 14 says this, together as they're on their way back home to Emmaus, together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, I love this, on their way back home, they're kind of remembering the events of the week. They're discussing the the happenings that happened in Jerusalem that week. and Maybe they went back to Sunday and they remember Jesus coming in on, on a donkey and, and the crowds shouting and rejoicing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Remember, we thought Jesus was entering Jerusalem at, to, 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 to set up his kingdom to redeem Israel, but boy, we were mistaken. Maybe they relived Thursday night when he was arrested or maybe Friday whenever he was taken before Pilate and Pilate said, okay, crucify him. Maybe they were talking about the lashings and the floggings that they beat Jesus to the inch of his life. Maybe they were in the crowds lining the roads that day on Friday when Jesus was forced to carry his cross to Golgotha. Maybe they were around when they nailed Jesus to the tree or they saw him hanging on the tree And they heard some of his last words like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing or it is finished. I don't know what they were discussing, but they were discussing and it actually came to arguing. 
That's how I know they, they had some anger going on as, as well. And it was at this point, a stranger joined their company. All of a sudden, this guy shows up and says, hey, can I walk with you? Can I, can, can I just have some company? And they said, yeah, come on. And, and the stranger asks, so what are y'all talking about? What are y'all discussing? And I love this in uh, verse Verse 19, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there these days? In other words, are you clueless? Are you clueless of what's just been happening? This Jesus, in fact, they said this. Jesus says, what things? The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people. I mean, they were, here's the irony. They're talking to Jesus about Jesus. Have you not heard? Don't you know what's going on? Are you the only one that doesn't have a clue? And we're talking about Jesus. And then he says this. I love this, verse 21. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. We were hoping that he was the one. We were hoping that this Jesus was the Messiah. What that tells me is they're no longer hoping. They're, they no longer have their hopes in this Jesus. That's, that ship has sailed. They, they are starting a new life and a new journey. They're talking to Jesus about Jesus, and they're saying, we were hoping he was the one, but we were mistaken. Well, then Jesus enters the conversation. I love this verse. Well, actually, the, the, the two disciples, verse 22 says, moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and and then they arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that he had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. They tell Jesus, here's what else happened. We've been told this story that he's alive, and here's, here's the side note. We're not buying it. In fact, in verse 11 of, cha- of, of the 24th chapter, the women came and told the apostles. They reported all the things to the eleven. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. These guys weren't buying it. These guys had put their hopes in Jesus. Jesus had disappointed them, and they're done with this Jesus. And then Jesus enters the conversation, and Jesus begins to teach them, then beginning, verse 27, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. So Jesus just takes a walk through their Bible. He says, let's just kind of look at the scriptures, your scriptures, Jewish scriptures, beginning with the law and all the way through the prophets. He just began to point passage after passage after passage saying, it just just points to this Jesus, does it not? And here's the other irony. Jesus is talking to the disciples about himself. But they don't see it. They don't get it. They don't recognize that it's Jesus. Even when Jesus is talking to them about himself from their scriptures, they still can't see it. Well, it ends up that this stranger, this Jesus, reclines at their kitchen table that evening. And so they're about to partake in the meal. And they're around the table, and Jesus takes the bread, and he blesses the bread, and he breaks the bread, and he gives the bread to them. And at that moment, their eyes were open. At that moment, they realized we have been in the presence of Jesus and didn't know it. We we had been in the presence of, of this Messiah because now they knew that this story of the resurrection wasn't just a story the women told them. It was true. They talked with Jesus on this road to Emmaus. They had sat around the kitchen table and they had reclined and they had eaten a meal with Jesus who was alive. It changed their whole perspective. Their their mourning, their grieving turned into comfort, turned into joy. Their despair, their hopelessness now was filled with with hope. They were rejoicing, and and before they they were frustrated and angry and arguing. In fact, here's what they did. They said, we've got to go back and tell the apostles. They've got to hear this. The women said that... 
the tomb was empty and angels had appeared to them and said that Jesus was alive, but can we really buy that story? How many of us have talked with angels? And how many of us have seen a dead man raised from the dead? And so they didn't buy that story, but these disciples on the way to Emmaus ran into Jesus, struck up a conversation with Jesus, ate a meal with Jesus, saw him in the flesh. We got to go back and tell the apostles. So they made their way back. By the way, Jesus just kind of disappeared from their presence. They got up and they made their trek back to Jerusalem that night, seven miles back. Why? The story was important enough to tell. So they get back to the to the uh, apostles, they meet, they're meeting with the apostles. And they're telling this, their story. I love this in verse 36. As they were saying these things, these two disciples, as they were saying these things, he himself stood in their midst. In other words, Jesus appeared. And now Jesus is with them. And so Jesus said to them, peace to you. But they were startled. I think I would have been too. They were terrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Why are you troubled? Jesus asked them. And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Why are you troubled? Because Saturday troubled them. Because the death of their Savior, their leader, their Messiah troubled them. And you and I would be in the same boat. We just don't expect dead men to rise, do we? Not. And so when you're standing in the presence of the one who you saw on the cross dead it would trouble you. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, peace to you. See, Saturdays are not fun to walk through. Saturdays are not fun to to experience. Where your world comes crashing down. It might be health-related. It might be that you have been given a diagnosis and, and it doesn't look good. It might be job-related where things just aren't going well. It might be relationship-related where relationships are just unraveling. Maybe it's with family. I don't know what it is, but you know what a Saturday looks like because you've been there. And what happens in our Saturdays is we are full of despair. We're full of questions. We're full of doubt, maybe some fear, and maybe a little bit of anger. And here's what I want you to know about Saturdays. God's with you in the middle of your Saturday. God's not going to ask you to walk this journey alone in your Saturday. Notice that Jesus went and met these disciples in their journey to Emmaus. In their midst of their grief and their despair and their anger and their fear, God was with them on their Saturday. Oh, it was Sunday, but guess what? They carried their Saturday over into Sunday because they were still living in their fear. And God's with them. God's with you. You have to walk it alone. And I love this because guess what? God does some of his best work on Saturdays. God does some of his miraculous work when you're at your lowest point. Isaiah says it this way in Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Now, what we don't know yet is Isaiah is talking about this Jesus. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Do you know, God is in the business of taking your brokenness and mending it back together. And I just believe we are rubbing shoulders with people who are broken. In fact, truthfully, one of you might be there. And your heart's broken, shattered. And you're wondering how you can keep going. God's in the business of taking the broken pieces and putting them back together. To proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. God's in the business of freeing those who are in captivity. And let's just be honest we often live in captivity. Captivity to, uh, to our thoughts or maybe held captive to our addictions. Maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's pornography, or maybe it's gossip, or maybe it's gluttony. 
You know, like, man, I've, I've, I've been trying to break this addiction, but I just keep falling and I keep failing, I keep tripping up. And, and God says, I do some of my best work in freeing those who are slaves to addictions. He's come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And you usually wouldn't hear that phrase when you're walking in a Saturday. When your world has come crumbling down and where you're, you're, you're hanging by a thread, you're at the end of the, your rope. Usually you're not thinking that God's favor is upon you, but Isaiah said, hey, this is the year of God's favor. I love this, to comfort those who are mourning, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, in other words, rejoicing instead of mourning, and splendid clothes instead of despair, a garment of praise in your despair. See, we are so familiar with Saturdays because that's called life, is it not? And the resurrection tells us this, that in your Saturday, it's not the end because Sunday's coming. See, if, if Jesus defeated death and the grave, then he can walk into your life in, in the midst of your Saturday, in the midst of your life just being shattered, and he can say, it's not over. It's not done. It's not the end. Because I know something you don't. Sunday's coming. Victory's coming. Comfort's coming. Beauty is coming. A new day is coming, so hang on. Because Saturdays won't last. You're in it now. I'm with you. And I'm going to do some of my best work on Saturday. So my dad, in 2017, went and had surgery. In UT Southwestern, and they were able to get all of the melanoma out of his nasal cavity. They did radiation. The doctor actually gave him six months to live in the beginning and, and, and didn't even think that surgery was possible. But surgery was done, and, and, and so he was able to live. His cancer was gone. March of last year, April of last year, we went back to the doctor. Same ear, nose, and throat doctors looked into his nasal cavity and said, It's back. But this time, it's getting behind his right eye, I think. and He's going to go blind. He'd already, he'd already lost sight in his left eye because the radiation took his sight. And this tumor now was behind his right eye, and so he was losing vision in his right eye. Eventually, he went completely blind. It's also probably getting into the brain, and you're probably not going to have the option of surgery this time. I give him not more than six months. There's an April. And on June the 3rd of last year, my dad passed away. Saturday for sure. A loss, grief, questions, doubt. But not despair this time. Because in the midst of that Saturday, we clung to hope that Sunday's coming. We, we clung to the fact that, that in Christ we can have joy in the midst of mourning because we know that Saturday is not the end. We know that, that death for those who place their life in Christ is not the end. It's just a transition. And so in our grief and in our loss and in our, in our Saturday, we were able to cling to a hope because Sunday was coming. We knew that. I can tell you my brother came in from Dallas and and we spent the week together and, and just had some good moments. I remember the, the night before the funeral. We were sitting around the living room and we were talking. My dad was funny. I mean, dry sense of humor, quick-witted. And so we were just talking about memories. And we laughed. We laughed to the point where we cried. And we weren't crying tears of grief. We were crying tears of laughter and joy. And we hurt because we laughed so much. There was joy there. And you know, we had hope, not because we have great memories, and we have great memories. We have hope because the tomb's empty. And Jesus defeated death, and he overcame the grave. And my dad had placed his life in his, the hands of Christ. And so what was true for Jesus when he defeated death in the grave, he promised to my dad. And so my dad's not dead. In fact, he's more alive now than he's ever been, and that's not cliché. He can see, actually. He's got his memory back. He was had some dementia. Hope in the midst of your Saturday. 
I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're going through. My guess is somebody here is right in the middle of a Saturday. And you're wondering if hope is even real anymore because yours has been shattered. You wonder if there's any reason to live. You wonder if there's any answers to your questions. I want to tell you, Sunday's coming. So in the midst of your Saturday, first of all, you're not alone. God's with you right there. And the empty tomb tells us that your Saturday is not going to be the end because Sunday is coming. Hang on. Look to Christ. Look to God to walk with you in your Saturdays because there's hope. Hope's not lost. Hope's not gone. Hope is here. Hope is in Christ. So I want to encourage you, if you're in a Saturday, look to Christ. He can make beauty come from ashes. He can take your brokenness and mend them together. He can give you life, life everlasting. He can give you life today. What a story. Their empty tomb changes everything. It changes your eternity if your life is in him. But it changes your todays. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we have an empty tomb and a a resurrected Savior. In In the midst of our hurt, in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our despair, and maybe even in the midst of our anger, and all of those are real emotions. And some, it may be right here or going through right now. Remind us, Father. Saturday's not the end. A new day's coming. And you do some great work in the midst of our Saturdays and our hurt and our loss. Father, for anyone who's just hurting right now, would you just would you just be close to them? Would you just remind them that you were right beside them in the midst of their hurts? And that there's hope. Although we might not be able to see it, there's hope hope in a new day hope in a resurrected Savior and if you're powerful enough to to be raised from the dead you're powerful enough to come into our lives and do whatever needs to be done in this season so we praise you and we thank you we have hope in you it's in Christ's name I pray